Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning to all of you. And so glad to see all of you joining us this morning for our Sabbath school. And uh, Sabbath school is a very important time to come and study together. In many cases, it's probably more important than uh, the divine service itself. You know, many people make divine service time the main course. And yes, that's a time that we worship God. But Sabbath school, I see as a time to sharpen our swords, to make sure that we are spending time in the Word of God and studying together and digging deep and being able to discuss and challenge each other. You know, we have, um, we have our Sabbath school in DAC and SAC where we study. We're actually studying the book of 1 Corinthians currently. We're trying to get through all the Pauline epistles. And, um, you know, it's a wonderful time where we break up into small groups. And unfortunately, we're not, we're not able to do that here. But I know that as we study together and as we spend time together, especially today, we're going to be looking at the Sabbath school lesson. We're looking at Sola Scriptura. And um, this, this quarter's Sabbath school lesson is actually very good. It's very interesting. And um, it's really about the Bible. And we're going to be looking at how to study the Bible. Of course, I'm adding extra elements here and there as um, you know, you're able to read the Sabbath school on your own. And I do challenge you um, and encourage you all to please spend time reading the Sabbath school. It, it's a very good quarterly. And the last quarter was very good as well. We had the book of Daniel. So uh, it's nice to be able to study together, friends. And so we're going to be studying Sola Scriptura by Scripture alone today. Very good study, very interesting study that we'll be looking at. But friends, you know, before we get into it, you already know the drill. For those that have been coming already and joining us every week, uh, please share something that you are thankful for, okay? Share something that you are thankful for, something that God has blessed you in this past week, all right? So please do share something that you are thankful for. I do have my praise ready, but make sure you type it out there. Make sure you share with all of us how God has been good to you. You know, this is now our new normal, new normal. And uh, I don't like to hear those words, but um, uh, it's everything's just been online this whole time. And I just I'm getting used to it, talking online and uh, just seeing my own face there. But I'm so happy to see people typing and sharing, knowing that there is a live audience that people are watching and that um, the efforts that we're going through to bring the service to you online is um, not going to waste. And so I pray that you'll be blessed. I want to share with you a blessing for this past week, something that I was blessed with this morning while eating breakfast. We connected to YouTube and watched a sermon by Pavel Goya, and he was just talking about getting out of the cities. You know, um, I think this is a time that is very relevant to that sort of message about getting out of the cities. Um, he gave a very balanced message and uh, I was really blessed by it. Somebody had shared it on Facebook there and I saw it as I was browsing last night and I just thought, you know, it'd be a good message to, to look at. And so very balanced, you know, don't get all the way out there where you're in the secluded areas and um, you're just not ministering to anybody. You know, God is not wanting us to get out of the city so that we can have a better life so that while everybody in the city is... Uh, in confusion and trapped, we can laugh at them. No, God wants us out there in this, the country and out of the cities, um, especially for young families, the corrupting influence that it has on, on young children. And I have three young children of my own, age three all the way up to nearly nine. And, um, you know, it's a message that spoke to my heart. And so with all that's going on with this lockdown and the MCO, there are many people that are posting. There are many people that are sharing. There are many people that are preaching. And, um, you know, we make a joke out of it that everyone's turned into online preachers overnight. Um, but uh, we can use this for a blessing. And I hope that it has been a blessing to all those that have been joining so far. But, um, you know, very, very important time that we and unprecedented times that we're, we're living in. And, um, you know, I just thank the Lord for that message this morning that spoke to my heart and how God is preparing his people. He's preparing his people to be ready to stand in these last days. And, um, 
you know, my wife and I, we are praying. We're praying that God would open the right doors at the right time to be able to move out into the country. And I think that uh, it's important times that we're living in and something that definitely we have to consider in this day and age. And, um, you know, very, very important message. So I just praise the Lord that being able to spend time in the Word this morning. And that is my fresh praise for today. So look, we are going to study into the Sabbath school. But before that, let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity again to open your word. And I pray that you'd please guide us, lead us. And as we look into the scripture, open our hearts and our minds. Help us to see the truth that you have hidden in there for us that we might search out these rich gems of treasure and that, Lord, you would help us to become students of your word this day. God is, O Lord, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. This is actually the scripture text for this week's lesson. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Let's turn our Bibles there. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Friends, this word sola scriptura has been the motto of the reformers, has been the motto of the early pioneers that went about preaching the word of God to the whole world. Ellen White says that these men knew what it meant to search the scriptures. And friends, look, we have to come back to this point in our day today where we put the word of God above everything. The Catholic Church has mixed scripture with tradition. And honestly, it is more tradition than scripture today. And uh, many churches even today hold tradition above scripture. In what sense? Um, If it was not the case, they would be keeping Sabbath rather than Sunday, of which there is no scriptural basis. But the Protestant faith was based upon this one motto, sola scriptura, the word alone. And that ought to be the final authority of our faith That should be where we base our whole belief system. This is where every argument should be settled. And, you know, it seems easier said than done because if that was the case, then we wouldn't have internal conflicts within the church itself, even in our own Seventh-day Adventist church, where we talk about issues such as uh, women's ordination, you know. But where does the Bible even come in in regards to things like that? We'll look at that today. And I'm just adding my little five cents worth, right? But look, friends, the Bible must be our final authority in everything. Let's turn our Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm looking at verses 1 through 6. Let's turn our Bibles there. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. Some of these texts I'm taking from the Sabbath school lesson and there's some very good information in there that I want to share with you today and there's some little extra things that I want to share as well. But 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, look at what the Bible says. Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So as ministers, we are stewards. We are his servants. We are the ones that should be serving him and doing faithfully the work that God has told us to do. But then verse 2, here moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing against myself, yet Sorry, I just saw the the video. Are you all still there? Can you all see me? I just want to make sure that everything is good there. But with me, it is a very small thing. Oh, verse 4. For I know nothing against myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Wherefore, judge nothing before the time 
until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall each man have his praise from God. You know, what was happening in the Corinth, Corinth, the church of Corinth, um, we had studied this in Sac and Dak, there was problems between um, not, not Peter and Apollos and Paul, but the people were choosing sides. You see that? People were choosing sides between, oh, I, I'm a follower of Paul. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm a follower of so-and-so. And, -so, and um, whoever converted them, I guess, that's where they became that follower. Do you see that? So people are choosing sides. And in, in some days, uh, even here, you find people that like to quote other people, isn't it? And uh, we like to quote the famous speakers in our Adventist church, all the way from our GC president down to the smallest of persons. Friends, we ought to quote the Bible. We ought to make sola scriptura. And this is where verse 6 then becomes really important in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us you might learn not to go beyond the things which are written, that no one of you be puffed up for the one against the other. Friends, what was Paul trying to say? Look, when it came to who you were choosing, Paulus and I, we are one. We have not gone beyond the things that have been written, Paul says, and we don't have anything of what Apollos ever wrote, but we have much of what Paul said. And of course, he was definitely called to be a prophet, but yet he says, Apollos and I, we're not divided. And so, friends, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, we can depend upon the Word of God, and we ought to for our final authority in everything. We must never go beyond what is written in the Bible. You know, I've heard so many people say, um, you know, somewhere in the Bible, I don't know where, but somewhere in the Bible it says this, and I remember reading it, and you know, Pastor no, I'm not lying, trust me, you know, this is really what I read. And they will say stuff like that. Um, but friends, we ought to be careful when we quote the Bible. It all began in the Garden of Eden when Eve misquoted God. She added what? Don't touch. God only said, don't eat. And the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. But if you touch it, she said, you'll also die. We ought to be careful that we don't go beyond what is actually written there. Now look, it does not mean that you just read the Bible and the Bible alone. There are tools that we can use to help us to understand certain texts and many texts. Um, resources such as lexicons and dictionaries, which gives us meaning of names, concordances, and other books and other commentaries. There's nothing wrong with reading that, except that it is meant to enhance our understanding of what the Bible's actually saying. You know what I mean? So, we must make sure we don't add to what the Bible is saying and we don't take away from it what is written there already. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, the very last chapter. The very last chapter. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto him, what? The plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city, which are written in this book. So, you know, we, we can localize that to the book of Revelation, but really it applies to the whole Bible. Be careful, don't add to it the things that are not written there, or else God says he'll add to you the plagues, and be careful not to take out from it what is already there, or else God will take out from us the, our names, the book of life, from the book of life. So friends, we got to stick by every word, every word. And, you know, I, I think that it's a really important, friends. I believe that every Christian, every Seventh-day Adventist should get a concordance. Strong's Concordance or Cruden's Concordance. There, there are two versions of the concordances out there. Cruden's was the one that 
many people our pioneers use and they went around with the bible on one arm and the Krugens, Krugens concordance under the other arm and they went and preached the gospel to the whole world friends if you don't own a concordance yet you need to buy one yes you gotta buy one why friends this is where sabbath school becomes important this is where the study of the word of god becomes really important to us to help us to understand not that you can't understand at all, but friends, there are certain tools that God has given to us and blessed us with in this day and age. And I want to show you the importance of having a concordance and that you don't rely on people to give you interpretations and meanings and applications and understandings of the Bible. Let's turn the Bibles to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. I want to show you why you should buy a concordance. Okay, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. Let's turn our Bibles there. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11. I want to show you its importance. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Our focus there is the word sanctuary. Okay? At the very end, it says the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, come down with me a few verses later to verse 14. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. The Bible says here, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So, the cleansing of the sanctuary, that word sanctuary there, is a different Hebrew word to what you see in verse 11. Did you know that? One is, in, the, in verse 11, the Hebrew word is mikdash, and in verse 14, the Hebrew word is kodesh. Now to us in the English, it looks exactly the same. It looks exactly the same. But when Daniel was writing it, and for those that could read Hebrew, they would know that this word sanctuary in verse 11 gives us a different understanding to the word sanctuary in verse 14. And you would never know that if you didn't have a concordance. And friends, people say, well, what, what's the big deal? It is a big deal because this actually is important to understand the word daily in Daniel chapter 8. But let me show you another example. We're not here to study the daily or study deep into the sanctuary. I'm, going to I'm just showing you why a concordance is really important. And if you don't have one, the first purchase that you need to make, the first thing you need to save up for is to own a concordance. And today I don't have, uh, I still have my first concordance that I ever bought over 20 years ago, but I don't carry that around anymore. It's really thick. It's really big. It's like a dictionary, okay? Maybe some of you don't even know what a dictionary is, but in the old days, we use all those hardcover Bibles. We never had all these touch screens and um, Bible on the laptop. Everything was done by books. And the dictionaries were big. My concordance was big as well. But you can buy those digital ones today, and I have one right here on my phone. All I need to do is click on the word, and it is so easy make it your first purchase. And if you don't have enough money, make sure you save up for it. A very, very important resource. But of course, I use many other resources, but this is the first one that you ought to focus on. Let me show you another example. We're still in Daniel chapter 8. Now let's read verse 15, okay? Daniel 8 verse 15. I'm showing you the importance of owning a concordance. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. So Daniel, he didn't understand the vision. When you look at that word vision, the, the Hebrew word is hazon, okay? H-A-Z-O-N. So Daniel didn't understand the hazon. But then you go to the next verse, verse 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. You see that word vision there? English word again, but it's a different Hebrew word. That word vision there is mare. Daniel doesn't understand the hazon. God says, Gabriel, help Daniel understand the mare. Verse 17, look at this. Verse 17, 
So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be what? The vision. So we see the word vision mentioned there again. And that vision is different to verse 16. It is the same as verse 15. It is Hazan. If you did not have a concordance, you would never know this. And friends, even if you heard a preacher say it, how do you know it's true? Just because it's preached, just because it's the pastor of your church, does it mean that he will never make a mistake? How do you know it's true? And the funny thing is, the rest of this chapter, not funny thing, but the interesting thing is, when you jump down to 26 and 27, vision is mentioned three more times. So in this chapter alone, you see the word vision mentioned six times from verse 15 onwards. And you would never know unless you had a concordance to go and check it up yourself. Friends, you can get even free concordances on the phones today. We have no excuse to not understand Scripture. Do you see that? You ought to go out and make sure you get a concordance today. This is really important, really important if you want to be a true student of the Bible. But look, if you don't have money, you pray and God will give you understanding. But I believe somewhere along the way, you'll be able to get that concordance. And friends, there are free ones out there. There are. I know on Android and iPhone, both operating systems, you can get a concordance for free. The reason why I bought mine is because I can use it on the laptop, I can use it on my phone, on my iPad, I can do all the searches that I need to no matter where I am. And many times I'm pulling out my concordance to use in Sabbath school at church. Very important, very important to check the preacher. Make sure you're writing everything down. Make sure you go back to check did I give you the right Hebrew words? How do you know that they really are different, except I said it? Well, it's because you're my friend and you trust me and I'm your friend. That's not enough, friends. It's not enough because the greatest of people, they make mistakes. It doesn't matter how good a preacher you are, no matter how close you walk with the Lord, all of us, we make mistakes. And I'm not saying that everything that I preach is exactly right. You have to go back and check it. And if it's wrong, come back and challenge me. Help, help me. Help me to see that I have preached something wrong. You see, so this is really important. Very, very important. Here's another example. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2. Importance of a concordance. I can't stress it enough. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So here John is saying he bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see that word bear record? In, even though in English it's two words, in the Hebrew, in the Greek rather, it is only one word. And if you click on that word bear record, the, the Greek word, you see a lot of English words are derived from the Greek, okay? And the Greek word for bear record is martyrio. M-A-R-T-Y-R-E-O. What does it sound like? It sounds like martyr. Someone who dies for the faith. And when you click on that root word, 3144, which is where the word bear record is based upon, it is the word martyr in the English. So when John says he bear record of the word of God, he bore record to the point that he was willing to die. Do you see that? Very important. Let's go to Matthew 24 and verse 14. Matthew 24 and verse 14, a scripture song that maybe many of us are familiar with, with. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Do you see that word witness? It's a different English word, and it is slightly different to the one in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2, but 
when you click on that word in the concordance, that word witness. Because many of us, what do you think of when you say the word witness? Oh yes, I'm going to go witnessing today, right? I'm going to go preach. I'm going to go hand out literature. I'm going to go sing. I'm going to, well, whatever we, we, we think our, our, our witnessing encompasses, we're going to go share about Jesus. Let's go Christmas caroling. We have many ideas of the word witness, right? But do you know what the word witness is? It's very similar. It's not exactly the same Greek word. But when you look it up, that word witness in the Greek is martyrion. Okay? In, in Revelation, it was martyrio. But here is martyrion. But the derivative, the foundation of where this word is taken from is the same as what you see in Revelation 1-2, which is martyr. So, when you read this, it gives you a different understanding. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. How? People willing to die for their faith. And that is exactly what we saw in the book of Acts. Everywhere people went preaching the gospel, they were persecuted. Stephen was the first martyr. He died, but because of that, the gospel went even further because of persecution and people spread out. And in a short while, the work of God was wrapped up. You see that? So without the concordance, without the concordance, you would not be able to understand all of this. So there are some things that you can never understand when it just comes to reading the Bible alone. You have to go and dig down. And friends, look, this is, not, this is not isolated to just pastors alone or scholars. I bought my first concordance in the year 2000, okay? I still have it. I told you it's really big, it's thick, and um, I still have it to this day. And guess what? I wasn't in theology school. I wasn't in theology school. I was, had no desire to go and study the Bible at least not full-time. I had no desire to be a pastor. In fact, even when I finished theology school, I still had no desire to be a pastor. My mom and dad told me to go do further studies and masters. I said, Mom, Dad, I don't want to go. All I can be after that is a pastor, and I don't want to be a pastor. Friends, be careful what you tell your parents, eh? <laughs> be careful what you tell God, because you know, he might just make your, the desire that you didn't want to come true. And it's not because I'm a pastor today, I'm will, unwilling. God has led me to this point that I want to be a pastor today, that I can't think of anything else. God has called me clearly to this. But, you know, 20 years ago, when I first bought my concordance, I had no desire to be a pastor. I had no desire to study theology. I bought it, why? You see, in my church back there in Australia where I was growing up, we had all the couples that watched over the youth, okay? And we called them our youth counselors. And it's important, you know, to have these people of experience and of age that have a burden for the ministry and especially for the young people. And, you know, one of them taught me how to study the Bible. Um, they pulled me aside one day to their house and, uh, you know, they just said, Ben, uh, let, let me show you how to, how to study. And, and then they challenged me and uh, pushed me to, to do a word study using the concordance. Um, it was Johnny and Tina Wong. You know, for those that know them, they're, they're in Gateway. And it was 20 years ago that, you know, that they'd moved in their, their condo there in the city and uh, Tina pulled me aside. You know, I, was, she, I was close to her and she pulled me aside and she said, look, let me show you how to do a word study. And she took me through the concordance. And this is really important. You know, Tina, thank you so much. If you ever watch this video, I want to say thank you. Um, you set my feet on the right path. And this is really important, friends. I was only a youth. I had no desire or intentions to ever quit my IT work and go and study to be a pastor. But this is what every person should do. This is where our focus should be. And the concordance, brethren, is a very important tool to be used today. How do you know I'm teaching you the truth? Let me show you. Acts chapter 17. And look at verse 10. You know, this is, this is a famous text. There's a famous group of people. 
all denominations know about this group of people. Acts chapter 17, let's turn the Bibles there. And verse 10, the Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Can you believe it? Paul the most prolific writer of the New Testament, he's, of course, they didn't know it at the time, but he's the most prolific writer of the New Testament. And he comes in and these people are like, uh, uh, okay, yeah, we hear you, Paul. We hear you, Silas, but we're still going to go back and check you to make sure that what you're sharing with us is correct and on point. And friends, how do you know that what I'm sharing with you about the concordance and the Greek and the Hebrew is correct unless you're going back to check it? All you can do if you only have just the Bible alone is just sit there and go, okay. And maybe you might go to Google and Google it, but how do you know that what you're reading there is correct? Wikipedia is not a good research. It's, it's people coming together, putting their own thoughts and ideas together. Yes, there's moderation to it, but um, how do you know it's correct? There are some things that are written in Wikipedia that I've seen before that is incorrect, right? You can't trust the internet. There's so much fake news out there and people think that coronavirus is fake news as well, right? How do you know you can trust these things? How do you know that what I'm saying is correct and I didn't just get it from someone else without doing my due diligence to study it out to make sure it was correct? Do you see that? These people in Berea, when Paul and Silas came, they did not even trust them. They made sure that they went back and checked whether these things were so or not. Friends, you got to go back and check. Why? It's for your own salvation's sake. How do you know that what I'm saying is not the truth? Maybe you might not agree with me, but how do you know it's not true? You see, too many of us, we come in with preconceived ideas or what we looked at last week, traditions. And we come in with these traditions that we've been raised with and thoughts that we have in our mind that this has to be true. And when someone comes along saying something and it challenges us, it gets difficult for us to accept. You got to go back and study it out. And maybe there might be a Pharisee that comes in your midst that has a really bad reputation. Maybe he doesn't live up to all the light, but maybe what he preaches in that one sermon is true. Even Jesus himself said, do what they say, don't do what they do. How do you know it's true unless you yourself are going back to check it? But more importantly, more than just searching, you got to pray, God, give me wise discernment to know the difference, right? What's the challenge in our day? What is the challenges that we face today that Jesus points out? You know, he says it over and over again. And I'm going to share with you about what? Eight, seven verses. Very clear. Matthew 21, 42. Matthew 21 and verse 42. This is in the Sabbath school lesson. It's very interesting that this was raised up. But the issue is too clear not to talk about this. Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus asked them, Didn't you read in the Scriptures? Matthew 19, verse 4. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4. What does the Bible say here? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye never read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? He asked them, Didn't you ever read? Interesting, eh? Matthew 22, 31. Matthew 22 and verse 31. Matthew 22, 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read? that which was spoken unto you by God? <laughs> Three times so far. Do you see the re recurring theme? Mark chapter 12, verse 10. Mark 12, verse 10. Let's turn there. 
Mark chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible says this, Have ye not read the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? Didn't you read this scripture? And then you go down to, to verse 26. Verse 26, look at what it says here. Mark 12, 26. And as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? Didn't you read? Didn't you read? Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 3. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6 verse 3. And Jesus answered them, answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this what David did, when himself was unhungered and they which were with him? Didn't you read? Jesus is saying, you guys are ignorant. You're ignorant of the scriptures. This is the problem why people think that when you die, you go straight to heaven. Or that the day of worship and the day of rest today is not Saturday, but it's Sunday. You have not, re not been reading. You're ignorant. Matthew 24, verse 15. Matthew 24, and verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso what? Readeth. Let him understand. And finally, Mark 13 and verse 14. Mark chapter 13 and verse 14. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, and then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Do you know how important reading is, friends? Our, our, our life depends upon it. Had people read the scriptures that was written, there would have been many that would have been saved in AD 70 when the Roman armies came and surrounded Jerusalem. Actually, before that, it was in AD 65 or 66, I believe, um, that the Roman armies came and then they suddenly left by the providence of God. But when they saw that happen, they were to get down from their house and run to the mountains. Ellen White says not a single Christian perished in those, in those fires and destruction. Do you know that? All those that read, they understood the word was very clear. They left and they ran. What is the challenge that we are facing in our day and age today, friends? Many of us, we're not reading. Yes, we're not reading. I tell you, if you just spend 20 minutes in the Bible every day, you will read through the Bible in less than one year. You might start slow. It might be difficult, but the more you do it, the faster it gets, the easier it gets. You will not be able to read fast if you hate books. I hate reading books, okay? I grew up hating reading. I just love to play. I love to play sports. I, I would play basketball on a Sunday the whole day. I would go in the morning, come back for lunch, go in the afternoon, come back for dinner, go in the evening. I would just play the whole day. Then I'd play badminton. Then I'd play volleyball. Then I'd play water polo sports. I'd play table tennis. I loved all the sports. I just loved to play. And then I came home, I'd play computer games. I just loved to play growing up. I hated reading to the extent I did so bad in my schooling. I knew that I would not ever get into medicine. My brother got into medicine. My dad's a doctor. There's no point in me trying. I knew I wouldn't get in. I was too lazy. My mom always said I was smarter than my brother. I don't know if that's true or not. I think she was just trying to point out the fact that I was lazy. But he got into medicine. But what's the problem? I hated reading. I never read. When my mom told me to go and study in the, the room, I'd come back, I'd come into my room, I'd sit here, I'd look at the paper for a little while, I'd flip through, I'd wait for one hour to be up, and I'd come out, pretend that I studied. The problem is we're not reading, friends. If we would only spend, and I'm talking, 20 minutes is not a long time, you know. Like, set a timer. If you would read exactly 20 minutes a day of the Bible, you would finish it in one year. You know, my wife re recently met one of our neighbors and um, she said something about the Bible so difficult to understand. She's like, no, 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 my husband reads it through every year. Every year? I can't even get through it in a lifetime. 
it really goes to show how little we read. You know, when I was in school in, in studying theology in U.S., I was at Heartland and um, I had to read nine volumes of the testimonies for the church. And uh, all nine, that is the requirement that you have before you graduate. And there are many students, they leave it to the last minute and then they would spend months, like a month, just scooped up in the house, just reading the whole day and they go crazy. You know, so the first year I got there, I was playing a lot and I messed up my time. And then finally I said, God, okay, I'm going to recommit my life to you. And I'm going to be serious about why I'm here. I didn't, I didn't quit my IT work and leave my, my nice paying job to come here and just play around. And it was in the second year that I began to take God seriously and began to read. And I took the word of Ellen White very seriously. You know, um, she gave this, she gave this uh, advice in councils of councils in education, CE 58.2. CE 58.2. Look what she says. And look, <clears throat> I'll expound on this after I read this, okay? CE 58.2. But there is but little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the Scriptures. One may read through the whole Bible and yet fail to see its beauty or comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. It's true. One passage studied until its significance is clear to the mind and its relation to the plan of salvation is evident, is of more value than the perusal of many chapters with no definite purpose in view and no positive instruction gained. Keep your Bible with you. As you have opportunity, read it. Fix the text in your memory. Even while you're walking the streets, you may read a passage and meditate upon it, thus fixing it in the mind. That's when, when I got to U.S., I bought a little pocket Bible. The whole Bible was this little pocket Bible. And everywhere I went, now we have phones. You know, we don't have to do that. But of course, with the phone comes a hundred other distractions that the Bible is priority number 100 after Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or whatever you guys have. Then it's the web browser. And then it's my, my bank account, even though I've seen it one hour ago, you know, we have many things to, to look at on the phone before we even get to the point of even reading the scripture. And friends, look, it's true. You shouldn't peruse many chapters, but let me tell you, perusing many chapters is better than not reading the Bible at all. You understand that? you got to get into the habit of reading and digesting and spending time in the scriptures. If not, you will never grow in faith. You can never be saved. For you are saved by grace through faith. Look at Hebrews 11. All of these great men of old and women of old, they exercised faith. And that's what got them to the point of God declaring them righteous. Righteousness by faith is what God calls us to today righteousness by faith friends just spend 20 to 30 minutes if you spend 30 minutes i guarantee you you get through the bible and i guarantee you somewhere along the way god will speak to you and i guarantee you that somewhere along the way god will begin to change your heart and life i know because he's done that to mine and he's still working on it today stop giving the excuses all of us were so full of excuses it's just it's annoying. You know what I mean? It's annoying. I'm a non-reader, friends. And I don't do this for my profession. I did this before I got to study theology. I was working on developing a daily devotional habit. And it really began with the Sabbath school. But I made sure that when they mentioned the text, I would look it up, you know? But you got to get into this habit of reading. And away with the excuses. Don't tell me you're a non-reader. So what? You fall asleep. Next time, instead of taking 10 seconds to fall asleep, it might take you 15 seconds to fall asleep. At least you're working at it, friends. You know what I mean? And the next time it takes you one minute. After that, it might take you five minutes. After that, you might be able to go one hour. But if you do it consistently, if you're reading, if you're spending time in the Word of God, guess what? You will not miss the second coming of Jesus. You will not know or not understand how to be righteous. You will find Jesus. He will live in you. 
he'll change you. And instead of the pastor having to preach the straight message, then you as a member will begin to say, let me share with you what I learned in my devotion and what God spoke to me about what we should be doing on the Sabbath or what we shouldn't be or, or this little passage about the scriptures. If only we are studying, if only we are reading. Friends, if you are listening to sermons for devotion, I want you to push yourself. If you've gotten consistent, then you start reading one chapter then two chapters, then maybe five chapters. And then you say, no, now I got to study a commentary. I got to sit down and I got to figure this out. You understand that? We got to read. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, look at what the Bible says. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Paul saying, until I come, while you're waiting, and while we are waiting for the second coming of Jesus, let us give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You can't exhort. You can't teach the doctrines unless you yourself are reading. And so you got to push. It takes effort. You got to put aside the, the desires of the world and the rush of the flesh and your own career and your own studies. Yes, you got to put something else aside so that you can read. Jesus says, didn't you read? And it could be that even the priests, they were just, they were repeating because they just knew that verse off by heart where Jesus would be born. Maybe that was a famous text in their days, just like John 3, 16 is a famous text in our days. Yes, you, you probably could quote some scriptures right now, but it doesn't mean that you really know Jesus. Not necessarily, friends. You got to spend time every morning and every evening. Set a tight, aside time to read. Read the Bible. And then read the pen of inspiration by Ellen White. Some of you people, you got, you got problems with Ellen White. It's because you're not reading her writings. How, how, do you, how do people know that Paul was a prophet in his day? How, how could he stand up in nearly every single epistle and say, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle? Now, all of you sit down and please listen. Because like the Bereans, they went back and they checked. So with Ellen White, go check her writings. Before you condemn it, before you say, no, she can't be a prophet, or give me some other evidence. Why do you keep quoting Ellen White? Why don't you go read it and test it? Read it and, and look up the verses to make sure that what she's saying is true. And if it is true, by the grace of God, follow it. Believe it. Live it. Do you see that? But many of us, we're not reading. Yet, all of us, we have an opinion. You know, I'll never forget this. One of my friends in church, um, this was back in Taiwan, he came up to me and says, Ben, everybody... Uh, 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 an opinion is like a nose. Everybody has one. Everybody's got an opinion. But friends, before you think that you should give your opinion, go and read it. Go and search it. Go and check it. Go back to make sure that if this person really is telling the truth, it's no longer his opinion versus my opinion. That is truth and my opinion has to change. My tradition has to change from what I've always thought to what this should be now. Let me show you what Ellen White wrote about William Miller. And you know, it's just a bit of a biography. Look at how William Miller studied the Bible. This is taken from Great Controversy 320, paragraph 1. GC 320, paragraph 1. Endeavoring to lay aside all preconceived opinions and dispensing with commentaries, he compared Scripture with Scripture by the aid of the marginal references and the concordance. With what? Concordance. William Miller used concordance nearly 200 years ago. He pursued his study in regu regular and methodical manner, beginning with Genesis and reading verse by verse, he proceeded no faster than the meaning of the several passages so unfolded as to leave him free from all embarrassment. When he found anything obscure that he didn't understand, it was his custom to compare it with every other text which seemed to have any reference to the matter under consideration. 
Every word was permitted to have its proper bearing upon the subject of the text, and if his view of it harmonized with every collateral passage, it ceased to be a difficulty. Thus, whenever he met a passage hard to be understood, he found an explanation in some other portion of the scriptures. As he studied with earnest prayer for divine enlightenment, that which had before appeared dark to his understanding was made clear. He experienced the truth of the psalmist's words. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. Look, I have a little... I have a little uh, link on my website at Advent Productions. I think it can be shared here. Um, Evelyn or Nosla can share this link on our chat here. I'll make sure I share it up later. I just took it from what I had found. It is William Miller's Rules of Bible Interpretation. And we are going to look at interpretation in the future. I thought that I would be able to have time to go through this this morning, but unfortunately, I don't know where the time went. I always seem to think that my time is going to run out and I'm going to be done in my, with my study in 30 minutes. I, I kept telling my wife that. I told her that yesterday. I told her that this morning as I was reviewing my notes and making sure as I went through it, I was going to be effective. And I, I, I was thinking, surely I was going to be done in 30 minutes. But here we are, nearly at the end of Sabbath school. I'm sorry. But please, I, I encourage you this afternoon, go back and go through every single text he has, I believe it's 14 rules of Bible interpretation. Very interesting. I learned a lot as I was going through this yesterday. Uh, some of it I knew already. But look, make sure you go back and, and this will even help you just begin to understand how to read the Bible, how to interpret scripture and prophecy properly. Okay, go back and read it and go through all the texts. Nearly every passage, every rule that he has, has Bible texts, I believe. Yes, every single one has Bible texts. So make sure you go through it, except number 12, okay, number 12, but, and number 14. But every single one has Bible passages connected with it. Go through it. Make sure you understand how to interpret Bible correctly. Make sure you read, you read, you read. Friends, I hope that you've been reading more during this time. I hope during the MCO, you've had more time to read. In fact, I've had less time to read. I've, ha I've had more time to study. I've not been reading, I've been studying because we've had Revelation class online and uh, something that I'll be preaching in the next, next Divine Hour service is it's come from my teaching of Revelation to the Revelation Salt students, the Salt Revelation students. And um, it's just something that touched my heart and I said, you know, I've got to share this to, to a wider audience. But from your studies, let there come forth, first, the change in your heart and what speaks to you. But then secondly, what you can share with people. What the Lord has touched your heart with and what He wants you to be a blessing to other people as a result. And so, friends, till Jesus comes, let's give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine that we might be true students of Christ, being able to rightly divide the word of truth, being ready in season, out of season. Whenever, if the pastor comes to you and says, hey, can you share for closing, divine, uh, closing Sabbath today? That you can be ready. Why? Because you've been studying, you've been reading, and there are things in there that have been speaking to your heart. That's what helps you to remember what you've read. As you sit there and you think about the words that you've read, that God would begin to transform your heart and life. Friends, we're going to look at how to study the Bible in the future Sabbath school times that we have together. I don't know how long um, this, this online studies will go for, but when we get back to our regular Sabbath schools and our regular churches there, um, we'll be starting up again with 1 Corinthians for both churches as we're both in it right now. But for now, we're going to go through the principles of biblical interpretation in the future Sabbath school times together. Please join us. There's much to learn. There's much to study. And there's many examples that we can go through. But for now, I want to challenge you to read. And before we go, I want to leave with you some homework. Okay? I want to leave with you some homework. 
Um, there's, there's a few things still that I wanted to say, but I'm going to leave that for, for future um, Sabbath school time. I'm going to give you three texts, okay? Get ready to write them down. Here are three texts, and I want you to tell me what they mean when you come back. Don't, don't, don't share it right now, okay? Come back next week and you type out your answer there. But in Matthew 19, 26, turn your Bibles there. Matthew 19, 26, this is the first text, okay? This should be an easy one. Jesus says, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. What is all things? Okay, that's Matthew 19, 26. The next text, Matthew 15, 11. Matthew 15, 11. The first is Matthew 19, 26. This is the second text, Matthew 15, 11. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. You know, people say that as a result, we can eat anything because it's not what goes in, it's what comes out, right? So how do you defend this? How do you know that this is not relating to just, I can eat anything now, okay? That's the second text, Matthew 15, 11. What does that mean? Can we really eat everything now? And uh, don't go to other texts. Stay within the chapter or within the book. And lastly, Revelation 13 and verse 1. Revelation 13 verse 1. I, I guess the Revelation students in Salt will be able to get this one by next week. But Revelation 13 1. It says that this beast with seven heads and ten horns. It has on its forehead the names of blasphemy. What is blasphemy according to Revelation? Don't go out from the book. Just stay within the book of Revelation. So these are the three texts. Matthew 19, 26, Matthew 15, 11, and Revelation 13, verse 1. And I want you to come back next week at 10 o'clock Sabbath school time and you tell me what is this meaning, okay? Um, what is all things in Matthew 19? Can we eat everything in Matthew 15, 11? And what is the names of blasphemy in Revelation 13? Okay? So you can search the whole bu the, the book, uh, that book, and you'll get the answer. You might not get it within that chapter for Revelation, but Matthew and the first two verses, you will. So let us read. Let us study. Make sure you go buy a concordance or go download one. Very important for the time that we're living in. We have no excuse to be ignorant of the Scriptures today. May God help us to that end and give us a desire. Let's pray that He would give us that desire to read and to read and to push. And if we don't have that desire, that we would manufacture it by just making an appointment to make sure we sit down and just read every day. And then it will grow in us because you'll see changes. And God will begin to change your heart and your mind and He'll give you an appetite for spiritual things. And then we can be solar scriptura. You know, I told you I was going to talk about this woman's ordination thing. I'm not going to tell you where I stand with woman's ordination. I'm just going to tell you what the scriptures ought to do when you study about woman's ordination. It should get you to the point where you don't have to go scream on the phone and tell the whole world how upset you are with the general conference with their decision. I've seen pastors get on the phone, record and publish it, how they are so angry and they're screaming. If they weren't ministers live, they might have been cursing. You know, with this woman's ordination, so it is with the, the topic of daily. If it's so ambiguous, just leave it alone. It's not salvational. Just leave it. For or against, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that you have the character of Jesus. You, you see that? The scriptures must change you to the extent that you're not getting upset. You're not going to get angry. And you're still going to be faithful, no matter what. You see that? So, friends, as we read, God will surely work. Let's spend more time in His Scriptures today. Let's take that time to read. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you for giving us the Bible. It was bought by the blood of martyrs, preserved until this day. And Lord, forgive us, for we've not treasured it. In fact, we have neglected it. Please help us. Help us to rise up out of the dust and the ashes and learn to put on the garment of righteousness. Let us make appointment with you 
to spend time in your word every day, Lord. Please help us to stop being lazy about our own salvation and our spiritual life. Help us to become wise unto salvation, O Lord. So please, be with all of us here, Lord. Give us a deeper understanding in your word as this new week we'll commit to walking closer with you and spending more time with you. So Lord, guide us to that end. Lead us, we pray, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending time here with us this morning. We are going to start up again at 11.30 for divine service. And we're going to be studying into the book of Revelation, a, a simple passage there, but I pray that you'll be blessed. And so please do join us in 30 minutes. And you have 30 minutes to think of another praise. So I'll see you all very soon. God bless. Bye-bye.